Laird Klingler, a librarian for the uh, Cornish Historical Society. Uh, we're here for an interview at the home uh, with uh, John and Linda Hammond at uh, Ballock's Crossing. Uh, Billy Scharf will be doing the filming, and the date is uh, March 29th, 2019. Um, thank you very much both for inviting us uh, you know, into your home. Uh, may we start with uh, where and when you were born, uh, Linda? Um, I was born in um, Suffern, New York, actually. My family lived in uh, Ramsey, New Jersey. Um, we lived on a, my grandparents' uh, family farm, uh, actually next door to them. They're, um, next to my grandparents, my great uncle and aunt lived down the road, and my cousins all lived across the road. So it was very much like living in New England uh, at that time. And, um, and then I moved up to Burlington, Vermont in uh, 73. What was the occasion for the move? Um, well, I had been coming up a lot. To, my cousin went to school in Burlington, and I had been coming up and visiting her quite a bit dirt, through college, and we did a lot of cross-country skiing, and I just decided to move up to Burlington. So, mm -hmm. Lived in a house with a lot of people and, oh, okay. on the lake. It was lovely. John? Uh, I was born in uh, Windsor. Uh, my dad was from Windsor, uh, and actually his family's lived in Windsor for generations. And my mother uh, grew up in Heartland, so I grew up in Heartland, uh, and uh, haven't haven't really moved too far. I moved out of state into New Hampshire. <laughs> uh, I uh, went off to college uh, in New Mexico, traveled around a fair amount, and then uh, came back home. And uh, Linda was living next door to my parents. And uh, so I tell people that I married the girl next door, which is <laughs> a true statement. Yeah. Well, uh, Linda, then um, how did you come, to get, come down from Burlington to Heartland? I uh, ended up in Heartland. I got a job at Vermont Handcart Signs, painting signs. And, um, and then I eventually worked at Heartland uh, Elementary School teaching art. Um, but mostly I painted signs uh, in Heartland. And then, uh, then you, that's how you met? Uh, we met at the Skunk Hollow Tavern. I was waitressing at the Skunk Hollow oh, yeah. Tavern. Yeah. And John was there. Um, yeah. Found out that she was living right next door, so. So you you didn't grow up on a farm then? Uh, yeah, you yeah, yeah, my, my mother uh, grew up on a farm. My dad uh, was in the, uh, his family had always been stonemasons. And uh, he had uh, gone to work for my grandfather. <clears throat> and then he went to uh, work for uh, O.W. Miller. Uh, running a ready-mix concrete plant in West Lebanon. That was 1957-1958 and uh, he eventually purchased half of the business and uh, they that was at the time when they were building the interstate and that sort of thing. Uh, he also uh, bought a farm uh, I think in 57 which my parents had, and then when they passed away, uh, there was five, there were six of us kids, and uh, a number of years ago, my siblings who all moved away decided they wanted to uh, sell their portion of it, so uh, we bought it from them, and our son lives there now. It's over in Heartland up on Mars Hill. Yeah. Well, when um, when did you then come to this location, Ballast Crossing? Well, I wanted to. Uh, John had got his first pair of ponies, and um, I wanted to, for a Christmas present. I wanted to restore a wagon for him, and somewhere I got Harrison Miles' name. Do you know about it? Harrison Miles, who owned this farm, and his buildings were just full of horse-drawn equipment, uh, snow rollers and sleds and wagons and plows. 
And somehow I got his name and I ended up buying a sleigh from him, uh, a wagon from him, and he helped me restore it right here in this kitchen. And um, I painted it for him, John and put his name on it and he just started horseshoeing and I gave it to him for a Christmas present. And that's how we met Harrison. And then and John met Harrison from there, right? Yeah, we, uh, we got married in 1977 and uh, I think we moved seven times the first two we were married. Caretaking. Yeah, we would caretake and Saved you know, we lived in a chicken coop there uh, for one summer and anyways, uh, Harrison was living here alone. He lost his wife and uh, I had come down to uh, work on some of his horses and told him that we were looking for a place to live and he said, well, uh, you're welcome to come here and stay. Uh, and uh, he said, but the place is for sale. So when it sold, uh, that would be the end of that. <clears throat> so we, we moved down here and uh, I don't know, I think we were here for about a week. And Linda and I went for a walk and we thought, well, maybe, maybe we could buy it. So we, uh, sat down with him, asked him if he would sell it to us, and so we agreed on a price. And, uh, we only uh, bought half of it. Yeah, we bought, we bought five acres, and uh, he gave us the right of first refusal on the remainder of the property. So we, we bought six acres. In the house. And with this house, uh, the barn was not part of it, and uh, Eight years later, uh, he decided he wanted to sell the rest of the property, so we ended up buying that. Mm -hmm. so, he lived with us for yeah. quite a while. And what was the man's name again? Harrison Miles. Harrison Miles? He yes. was a, a, a well-known horse trader, right, John? Yeah, he, he had horses, and he would buy and sell horses. Lippet. He was in uh, Morgan's. In Morgan's. And he was a Connecticut Yankee. Well, um, tell us about the history of this house. Well, it was, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it was settled by uh, a Scottish immigrant, uh, James Ballock, in 1790. Uh, and I think he and his family lived here up until, I think it was the early 1900s, one of his descendants married a, uh, uh, a widower who had a son. Uh, his name was Fred Davis. He lived here. And uh, then when he died, uh, it was purchased by uh, Peeny Goodwin, who was a well-known uh, person in Cornish Plainfield. And uh, Harrison Miles bought it from him, and then we bought it from Harrison, so I think uh, the house really didn't have a whole lot of wear and tear, I think, until we moved in. We raised three kids. And, uh, but it does go back to the early... Yeah, it was one of the earlier homes in town. And what do you, when do you think it, part of it was built? Well, the brick part was built in 1814. That's the part of it. In the front, front part of the house. Uh, the 18? 1814. And, uh, but it doesn't have a full cellar. It has a crawl space. Uh, the section that we're sitting in uh, is the wood frame and uh, that was built around 1840, but it has a full cellar, which makes me think that this portion was probably the original settlement and they tore the original building down and added on to it after the brick part was built. So uh, that's that's what I think. Uh, the other thing was the the barn, uh, the dairy barn, uh, was built by my great grandfather, uh, and I didn't realize that until I was out in the barn one day and and. Uh, 
on the back side of one of the barn doors. Uh, it had his name and all the people that that built the barn. Uh, apparently, uh, half of the barn sat over next to the railroad crossing, and uh, he picked it up, moved it on rollers with oxen, and then doubled the length of it. And it's basically built out of secondhand material uh, for five hundred dollars, which pretty that amazing. That was Dwight Hammond. That was yeah. That was Dwight Hammond. And Javis Hammond built the blow me down. Yeah, yeah. Um, and his great great. Yeah, guy. his father, Javis Hammond, uh, was a stonemason, and he built the uh, blow me down mill. He uh, built the Stone Arch Bridge under Route Twelve A. He did a lot of work for the Cornish Colony back in the. And his name, Jabez Hammond. Um, just say a little bit too about about Ballast Crossing. You know, this was the uh, the railroad stop. Yeah, yeah there used to be a, a, a milk stop out there, uh, and there was actually a little uh, uh, little uh, workers' house, and uh, the the railroad came through in 1847. Uh, in 1927, they had a, uh, a train wreck, and uh, apparently uh, there were. It was around noontime, and I think there were either three or four railroad workers that were having lunch, and the train went through, and one of the cars had derailed, and it struck the building, had a coal fire going, and. Uh, all the people that were inside burned to death. Apparently, it was pretty catastrophic. Now, uh, living close to Windsor, um, it seems in Cornish that if you lived on the other side of town, you went to Claremont. This side went to Windsor. Was Windsor the place that you would have shopped? Or, or, or? Uh, yeah, and and I had some diaries from uh, William Ballock and. Uh, they made the trip to Windsor almost daily in in his diaries. They they traveled to Windsor almost every day. Well, what about you two now, Linda? For example, I always like to ask Windsor past and present. Do you have what are your memories of Windsor in the past as compared to uh, the present? When we first moved here, yeah. um, I don't think it's changed a whole lot. Um, it's just. Uh, we do most of our shopping, our um, grocery shopping over there. But, and it's just it's, closer. Yeah, it's closer. Well, of course, of course the John in remembers, industry. John remembers Windsor when there yeah. was a, a movie theater. Oh, you um, do? Yeah, there was a there was a movie theater. Right, I think right. it was, I think it was twenty five cents to go to the movies because we used to go there uh, Saturday afternoons. They'd have a western or something, so parents would drop us off there. Um, when uh, Cone and Goodyear were running, they had uh, three traffic officers at the end of every shift directing traffic. Um, it, Windsor was really a, a, a booming town uh, back then. Um, a lot of machine tool uh, companies, woodworking shops. There was a lot of people that worked first, second, third shift uh, in one of the shops. I, I read about um, dances that used to be held at the Windsor House. Huh. Did, did you two ever go to the dances at the Windsor House? Or not, you... not at the Windsor House. Uh, we used to, when we first moved to town, they used to have dances at the uh, town office upstairs. Contra uh, dances. Contra yeah. dances. Oh. Uh, my, my dad said that they always called that the uh, Slab City Dance Hall, because that little section of Cornish, he always called it Slab City. Apparently there were some sawmills that were on the brook there. Is the term slab related to the sawmills? And I believe so, yeah. yeah. Because I, I've heard, yeah. read about this, yeah. Slab City, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And did, his, did, he, did he come over to the dance or something? Oh, my father did, yeah. yeah. Huh? yeah. He spent a lot of time... Uh, Cornish Windsor. Up on the second floor? Yep, yep. With the Grange? Yep, yep. With the, they got a little stage there. 
Oh yeah, yeah yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's where that's where the band used to sit up with the piano. And, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, um, okay, well, Linda, you start. Uh, tell us about your children. Now, you have, you have three. Children? We have three children. Um, Jabez Hammond, the third, oh. and uh, Hannah and Matilda. Uh, Jabez and Hannah live in. Jabez and Matilda live in Heartland, and Hannah is in South Carolina. So Jabez went to Hanover High School, and the girls went to Windsor High School. And all three of them went through the Cornish school system. And that would have been a central school at that point, probably, right? In Cornish? Yeah. Oh, yeah. When they were going. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, let's get to um, some of your... um, some of your volunteer work now. Um, uh, John, of course, quite extensive, you know, being on the select board. You know. uh, how long have you been on the board? Oh, see, I think I think I uh, got on the board, it was in 2006, so it's been 13 years. 13 years. Yeah, and I I was on the planning board for quite a while before that, uh, and being on the select board, you get put on other boards: uh, conservation commission, uh, town forest. Uh, I I haven't ever been a fair director, but I've always tried to be active in the fair. Uh, we, Got a blacksmith shop there that uh, uh, built. You started the um, horse. Yeah, horse I, horse I, when, I, when we first moved to town, uh, we we uh, I got together with a couple people and we uh, had uh, a farm horse class, which still goes on today. That was you know, over thirty years ago. Uh, yeah, I tried to. Be active in the community. You have, you have. Yeah. Linda, I know um, you're active in the Garden Club, and I know you've been actually, uh, as an artist, um, you've been you've done a lot of volunteer artwork, um, but you also teach art too in, in the schools. Yes. Um, see, I I was in I did the um, art contest at the fair for oh, 25, 30 years. I ran the children's art contest and the adult for a while and um, I teach art um, in I've been teaching art for what 25 years at home um, I taught at the uh, various um, private schools and a couple of public schools and I'm still teaching here in my house I have a studio upstairs I bring in groups of homeschool children and and um, I've been doing that for a while. I love it. There, there are no art classes. I'm going to correct me if I'm wrong. Are, at the Cornish School now, are there, are there any opportunities for art at the school? I think they have an art teacher. Do they? School. Do they? Yeah. 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 By the way, I'll just show you this. This is something Linda's doing now. Oh. Tell us about this. Can you get this in, Billy? It's needle felting, and that's a chickadee that I've been doing uh, birds, and um, I've done some rabbits. And some turtles. I've been doing turtles. This is quite impressive. It's made out of my wool. I used to raise sheep, and I still have wool left, so I've been felting it. Hmm. Now, um, so in, in terms of uh, occupation, it's been art and then teaching art. And, and I ran the canoe rentals um, in 1980. I'm sorry, the new canoe rentals. Canoe oh, the North, rentals. North Star Canoe. Um, in 1980, uh, my dad gave me gave us um, six, six aluminum canoes. And a trailer. And a trailer. And we hitched it onto, I had a small Toyota truck. And we would put the people in the back of the truck. Um, on the floor. On the floor, in the back of the truck, the customers. And I'd put the children in the front seat with me. And we'd drive up to the bridge and drop the canoes and the people off up, up there and they came down. So. Uh, by the time we, I retired last two years ago, by that by then we had um, uh, like a hundred kayaks and, and canoes. And canoes. 
four or five trailers. 120 trailer. kayaks and canoes, four or five trailers, yeah. And a couple buses. So it really grew. It grew I, I took one of your trips on the river. Did you? And it was really enjoyable. You, know, yeah. you had an opportunity to see things you otherwise would It's a really see. beautiful stretch of the river. Yeah. But, but that you don't do that anymore now. That business is closed. Yep, I, um, I closed two years ago. 37 years was long enough. That, uh, tell us about your work. Well, uh, when I moved down here, I uh, was starting a career as a, a horseshoer or a farrier. Um, I've been doing it 42 years, still, still doing it. Um, I uh, traveled around, basically covered New Hampshire and Vermont sometimes go out of state to Massachusetts or Maine. <clears throat> but I've been I've been doing that since we moved here. Uh, and then uh, for the last 30 years or so I've been uh, breeding horses. Uh, I've uh, raised Morgan horses and then of late uh, I uh, have some uh, Suffolk horses and some Cleveland Bay horses both of which are a rare breed and uh, and then I cut a lot of hay and, and uh, sell hay and oh I cut a little firewood. I remember that you took a trip to England or was it England or Great yeah. Britain? Yes, you know, I've, I've been over there a number of times. I've, I've bought a couple horses in England and imported them. And which ones were they? Well, I've, I uh, imported a Suffolk Stallion from England, and then I also imported a Cleveland Bay Stallion from England. And uh, the offspring that have resulted from them, I've sold around the world, really, uh, all over the United States, uh, Canada. Uh, I sold one to uh, Australia last year. So, uh, how does one go about s selling uh, these very Well, I used to I used to advertise in the uh, publications, but with uh, Facebook, uh, I realized that there were a lot of groups that were breed specific, and uh, so what I what I did was I joined those groups and. Uh, when I had some stock for sale, I would take some good pictures and uh, give the information of pedigrees, age, oftentimes pictures of the sire and dam, and uh, just posted them for sale and uh, at no cost other than your internet membership or whatever. Uh, and it's it's made a huge difference. How do you transport the horse then to the owner? Well, generally what happens is they take care of uh, the transport. Uh, I've had some that have gone to oh, uh, Saskatchewan, Texas, um, and what they do, there are contract livestock haulers that will come and pick up the animal and then transport it. Uh, the one that went to Australia there was a group of uh, three horses that all went as one group, and uh, they actually uh, uh, went to Lexington, Kentucky, and went through a quarantine period, and then, then they put them on a, a cargo plane, and they fly them to uh, mm -hmm. New Zealand, and they go through another quarantine, and then they uh, flew them on to New South Wales, Australia. Do you actually do breeding here then? Oh yeah. You yeah. do the breeding? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the foals are born here then? Yeah. 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 He, I, he sells a lot of um, to the Amish. Amish, yeah. I've done a lot it's of business a, with the Amish. Got, it's got a word of mouth through the Amish. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of horseshoes and uh, farrier work, when I see the horses riding on the roads in Cornish, do they all have horseshoes? I would say that probably most of them do. There are some folks that, that don't put shoes on them. Uh, what, what's the thinking there? Um, well, usually it's uh, traction or protection. 
like if you're riding on rough ground, uh, or if they've had an injury and they need some concussion uh, to soften the concussion on the on the feet, you put shoes on. Uh, there's as many different kinds of shoes for horses as there are uses. You know, uh, a horse that's playing polio, polo wears a completely different shoe than a horse that's, uh, say, doing rodeo work or uh, a draft horse that's uh, working in the woods. They just have different, different kinds of shoes. When I see horses just out in the field, if they're not being ridden, would they not need shoes? Or, uh, no, I, I generally don't put shoes on them unless there's a specific need for them. Uh, what I usually do is I, I pasture my horses in the summertime, uh, the mares, and I run a stallion with them. Uh, I kind of let Mother Nature do the work instead of me. Uh, you know, the stallion knows when the mare's in season. And uh, I've found that the stallions are much easier to handle if they're socialized with mares rather than you take a stallion and you confine it and the only time he is with a mare is when he gets to breed the mare. Uh, they can be pretty unruly and dangerous, actually. Um, I'd like to just move now. I always like to ask um, about Cornish past and present. Now, I think you said you came here in the 70s, approximately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you would have come after the completion of the interstates. Yes. Primarily. Yep. Right. Yes. Yep. And people, when I ask past and present, people generally point to two things. The improvement in the roads and the, the decline of the school population. Mm -hmm. um, now, Linda, when you came here, um, did you notice, at that time, I think there had been a great improvement in, in the roads. I mean, is that something that you would have noticed driving around? Or, uh... um, I noticed that there weren't as many dirt roads that we used to sleigh ride dirt roads in, in Heartland that I kind of missed the dirt roads. So I think I have a different perspective than everybody else. But um, no, I didn't pay much attention to the roads. Um, John might have. I, I, I think that when, uh, when we first moved to Cornish, the, the population of the school was considerably uh, larger because they were Put the addition to the to the gym, the gym. of the gym, and uh, that was because they needed the room. And uh, in the past ten or fifteen years, the you know it's changing demographics. You know, there's uh, I think the uh, there's a lot more people that have retired to Cornish, and maybe fewer young families. That there were when. Let, when we can I just stay with the roads, for example? Sure. And then we get to the school. Yep. A little yep. Later. Yep. Um, some people, before you, older people, talk about during the, during the snows or the mud season, they would have to park down, for example, on 120. Yep. And walk. You know. Well, when I first moved here, uh, I went up to Grace Bulkley's the first time. Uh, they had some horses up there. And she called me up to come up and do the horses, and uh, I had to walk in from 12A. <laughs> and Slade Hill is a steep hill. <laughs> That's pretty steep, steep going and up. It's a, it's a long hike. And you had to carry your equipment. Yeah, through. and I was the first the first time I went up there. I didn't think I was ever going to get to the top of the hill. Uh, <laughs> but but that is a noticeable improvement. Oh know? yeah. Oh and, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think there's been increased traffic. Um, uh, I think back in the 70s and the 80s, there was an increased number of in the population. Uh, and I think in the past 10 or 15 years, it's, it's been pretty much stagnant, maybe even gone backwards a little bit as far as population. And I think that's reflected in the school population as well. Um, more thoughts on the declining school enrollment? Yeah, um, when we came, uh, with our son was in school, um, things started to 
grow quite a bit. And by the time our youngest child was finished with school, um, there would there, when Jabez started, there was one class per child, and then it started to be two and three classes. And I think now they're, they're splitting, they're sharing classes, um, they're um, combining classes. Um, so there's been a huge decline. I think that's in general, though. I think the, in a lot of the area schools are declining. Some people say that well, one of the reasons for the decline is that uh, the people who had children uh, have stayed in town <laughs> as they've gotten older, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, now this, this brings up another point too. Um, this has been raised in the other interviews. Um, to what extent do our, um, our our land policies, our current use, our five-acre zoning, to what extent do they limit the ability um, for young families? With children to move into town. Uh, thoughts, you know, on that. Um, well, I guess that all depends on who you speak to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when we first moved to town, they had uh, implemented a policy that uh, if you owned a tract of property, you were allowed to. Uh, save two two acre pieces for uh, family members so if someone had a farm and uh, they had a couple kids that needed a place to build a house or so they could they could get two acres of land and and build a house uh, but uh, Prior to that, it had been a five-acre five acre minimum, uh, and uh, I don't know, I, I'm going to say it was probably eight or nine years ago, might even been ten years ago, they, that went away. Um, one of the problems in town, I think, is, is uh, the geography, uh, it's, there's a lot of steep places in town that are really pretty tough to build on um, and uh, the downside of the five acre lot size is that oftentimes um, the least expensive place to build a home is in a field and so if you build in a field, oftentimes that, that land is taken out of agricultural use. Um, and there's a, when they do the uh, uh, surveys in town, one of the big things is uh, people like the, the agricultural land views, use, that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know, uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, cluster housing where what they'll do is decrease the lot size, put houses in a, uh, a smaller, more concentrated area, uh, so it's kind of like a little neighborhood. Um, some, some folks have, have done that, uh, but then I think there's a lot of people that they want to have their own privacy, so it, it, it depends on who you're talking to and, and what their priorities are. Uh, I think a lot of uh, retired folks are maybe not so apt to think that way, whereas if you've got a young family, if there's a, a, you know, a neighborhood where kids can get together and play, uh, when we move down here, for years and years, our kids didn't have any kids to play with here. No, no, no. We never got anybody on Halloween. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, it, I, I think there's a there's a, an argument for and against both of those issues. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it, it is certainly a complex issue. Um, Everyone wants to preserve the rural character, mm -hmm. you know, of, of the town. Um, and, for example, Steve Taylor has said, has pointed out that the current use, 
a really amounts to a property tax transfer. That if you're not in current use, you are absorbing Correct. part of the budget, you know, that other people in current use. Now, no one has ever questioned current use for people, in your case, for, for farming or agricultural pursuits. Mm -hmm. Many people have current use that do, do not pursue that. Um, it, it is a difficult issue. Um, yeah, the only, the only thing that has, uh, and, and that's been changed a couple times, was uh, if you have land that's in current use, say you've got, you have to have 10 acres for current use, if you own, uh, say, a 20-acre piece and you want to take five acres out and sell it to someone to build a house, then there's a uh, current use tax, a land use tax. And uh, basically, if you take land out of current use, you uh, pay a 10% uh, of the assessed value to the town and uh, part of it now goes to the Conservation Commission and another part of it goes to the town itself. Uh, and I think that, that uh, there were times when there was, I'm not sure I'd call it a building boom, but there were more houses that were being built there was a fair amount of uh, change use tax that was that that was taken out of current use and was paid to the town. Uh, but the last four or five years, uh, there really hasn't been a lot of new housing. There's mm -hmm. you know sheds and barns and that sort of thing, but new homes being built in town is you know hasn't really been as strong as it's been in the past. Do you think there's um, a possibility for the development of more of these smaller homes? Um, well, certainly yeah. uh, energy efficient homes. Yes. yes. Um, I know the Cornish Energy Committee has is, is, uh, tried to educate the public by having forums on um, solar and, and uh, uh, energy efficiency, insulation, that sort of thing. You know. Um, I, I would like to advocate or just bring up one thing that I have noticed. Um, and everyone is very proud of, of the town meeting. Uh, the fact that it's on like at, at noon on a Tuesday um, is really a reflection of the past agricultural base. Mm -hmm. You know, what, when the farmers would get up, milk their cows, they had time to come during the midday. It's very different now today because people have jobs right. outside the community. And if you look around at, at the town meeting, I see a lot of gray hair. Uh, that's you know, the truth. You know, I, I don't see, because many of the young people with jobs, they have to go to work. They have to go to work. Do you think there's any possibility things might change? I think you know, years ago, and I don't know when it was, they tried uh, to have a town meeting on a Saturday. Uh, and I don't know how long that went, but they decided to change it back to the uh, Tuesday, second Tuesday in March. Uh, uh, I don't know if that was tradition <laughs> right. or what. I do, I do know that Cornish is one of the few towns in the state that observes Memorial Day on the 30th of May. <laughs> right. And uh, at one point, we, uh, when I was uh, first got on the board, there was a discussion of uh, maybe having it on uh, the Monday that the state observes it. And uh, there was probably six or seven veterans that came in. Most of them were World War II veterans. And said, you know, it's supposed to be on the 30th. <laughs> and so that's when we have it. Yeah, sometimes slow to change, but... Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so. But I do, I mean, I'm, I'm retired. You know, I'm older. It's fine for me on Tuesday. Yeah, but change do, isn't all bad. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean you, but you can see who are the people in oh, town yeah. making the oh, decisions. Yeah. yeah. And that's not yeah. sustainable. We need the younger people. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, 
And, and also in relation to children, you know, with the community and you know, uh, the, the school, the school uh, meeting is always on a Saturday, yes. and that, that tends to be a little better attended than yes, town I, meeting. I noticed that this yeah. year, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's also a considerably bigger budget. Well, you have done a fine job in keeping our taxes down. Well, yeah. we try. Yeah, you, have, you, know. Uh, you know, if you look at some of the adjoining communities, yeah. you know. Yeah. 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 Uh, I have learned that uh, no matter what you do, uh, there's some people that are going to be happy, and then there are some people that aren't going to be happy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just how it works. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I just have one member of the community very grateful for your service. That, you know, I mean, it takes a lot of time. You know, and, well, you know it's uh, we meet twice a week for two hours. Do you get do you get irate phone calls at home? Uh, I have gotten irate phone calls. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's an intrusion on your Yeah, it's usually, usually during mud season or oh, during a right. snowstorm. <laughs> well, um, listen, I, I, I've enjoyed the, uh, our discussion very much. Um, just before we end, uh, um, people often say to me at the, during these interviews, that, oh, I forgot to say this, you know, and, I, and I, maybe I forgot to ask questions too, but is there anything that, uh, say, so Linda, anything you would like to add that we haven't covered so far? No, I think you've done a great job, uh, and I appreciate you doing this for the town. I, I really appreciate that. John, anything else that you'd like well, to add? Well, the only thing I can say is that uh, my wife has always made me look better than I really am. <laughs> Good for you. Okay. All set? Yep. Okay. Well, but I always like to say at the end, okay, Billy, that's a take.